Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us. This is the committee. It's Thursday, February 17th, and it's like about 101. Um, so what we're hoping to do, what we're planning to do this afternoon is uh, use some time to hear that what we, we heard from the Green Mountain Care Board uh, with a proposal, or actually with their hospital sustainability uh, report, and uh, that included a proposal uh, with a budget proposal as well that accompanied that. And uh, clearly we wanted to also have the opportunity to hear from uh, the hospital association and hospitals. And we're, we're gonna, uh, so we invited Devin from uh, Voss to join us this afternoon and invited the Green Mountain Care Board to come back and try to spell out more of what their proposal uh, the financial proposal entailed, uh, and I see that they've a number of folks from the Green Mountain Care Board are here. Uh, but I'd like to start first by uh, inviting uh, Devin, if you can, uh, and I understand there's some uh, document that you have that you might want to share on the screen, because uh, there's been a little technical difficulty in getting it to us apparently. But uh, let me let me turn it over to you, Devin, and invite you to comment uh, on behalf of us about the Green Mountain Care Board Hospital Sustainability proposal. Great, thank you. Um, Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And yes, I do have a PowerPoint that I sent like four times and for some reason it's not going through. So let me share my screen. Believe me, we are all sympathetic to the <laughs> Challenges of our hybrid world. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so thank you for having me come in here to talk about Vermont Hospital Sustainability and the uh, Green Mountain Care Board's proposals. Uh, before we do that, I did want to <clears throat> speak a little bit about who we are. When I say I'm representing Vermont's hospitals, uh, we are 15 nonprofit hospitals and two government hospitals, although I don't um, represent uh, Vermont uh, uh, Psychiatric Care Hospital, um, but those are the, that's the makeup of all of Vermont's hospitals. We have eight critical access hospitals, one academic medical center, seven designated hospitals who serve um, mental health patients, and one FQHC. I do want to sort of step back and think about what our hospitals look like, because I think um, when we hear from the consultants, you can get this feeling that each hospital is providing each service. And if we just cut down on some of those services, that will help. Um, but that's not where we are at today. We have a lot of hospitals that share services. I know North Country and NBRH. Uh, up in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, share services. We also know that there are hospitals who employ physicians on a part-time basis, basis where they come in once a week. So in areas where it might look like there are just a couple of procedures being done that could potentially be done by a Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center doctor coming in once a week. Um, so a lot of the things that the consultants talked about hospitals doing, we are doing them. Um, as always, I think there's room for improvement and discussion about what optimization looks like, but I just wanna paint that picture that we're a pretty uh, lean system already. I also wanna just take you back to pre-pandemic and where we were going with healthcare reform. We were moving towards global, or not towards global budgets, but towards value-based care with one care in our ACO. Um, that effort resulted in a Medicare savings of $122 million that was statewide, um, but pretty significant. You can see in this chart that we compared to other states, uh, our uh, spending was going down. At the same time, we were following that issue of, um, you know, uh, moving people away from high cost care. We reduced hospital stays and length of stay by 9.3%. 
We reduced specialist visits by 7.7% and we decreased by 22% any unplanned readmissions. So we thought that this struck a good balance between trying to move away from that high cost care um, and move towards preventive primary care without losing um, quality, uh, which you can see in that decrease in unplanned readmissions. And can I just try to jump in for a minute, uh, Devin? And I think it's it's important that you're talking about pre-pandemic, yes, rather, rather than because there's a there's of course in during the time of the pandemic everything has been uh, on its head uh, in terms of measuring all kinds of things. So that I just want to. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the underlying statistics are that you're using, but that's this is for the pre-pandemic period that you're referring to generally. Yes, this specifically is the halcyon days of 2019, where we were all innocent and <laughs> we were just moving along, having no idea that a pandemic was about to hit us. Yeah. Um, so. Because of our sustained effort of moving towards value-based care, of having the Green Mountain Care Board and our, um, our hospital budget process, uh, you can see that uh, our margins decrease significantly over the years. Um, and I put on here, so this is a graph I sort of took from the Green Mountain Care Board that had our margins. We had looked at that last year. I also put on here uh, a CMS uh, sort of cost inflation indicator that they always predict for hospitals and I can present a citation for that but you can see here with the light blue line on top um, just how significant that amount of our margin is from the sort of uh, inflation increase that and cost increase that hospitals were expected to see so a lot going on there. Um, we were definitely a lean system going into the pandemic. And as you can see in FY 2020, um, particularly lean um, with about 3 million margin for the system. That's, now we're that's, in a, that's on a system-wide cost of roughly... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, I had that number, I think, and the Green Mountain Care Board might know better. I mean, it is about, uh, I don't want to say it off the top of my head. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll ask them, we'll ask them to help we'll, us We'll look it up right now. I, I can throw out a number, but I'd rather not. We'll look it up. Yes, right. thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so... That's where we were going into COVID, very lean. Um, here we have the COVID emergency response, um, which you know everyone has COVID exhaustion um, and you don't necessarily wanna relive this, but I just have to take you all through this uh, to show what uh, the hospital did and all the folks who are working in the hospitals did. So hospitals set up incident command, they acquired PPE and other supplies. You also helped the state acquire PPE and other supplies. We stood up COVID specialty units. We partnered, we partnered on alternate care sites on staffing those and standing those up. Um, we suspended procedures. We stood up statewide testing and statewide vaccination. I think here it felt natural for us to work with um, the state of Vermont to do those statewide vaccination and statewide testing efforts. In other states, when I talked to them, all, their, their state did that. That was not something, the hospitals vaccinated their own people, they would vaccinate their patients when they came in, but they were not standing up statewide vaccination efforts. We were doing those with you know, thousands of pages of spreadsheets and names that we were getting from our um, health, our local healthcare providers and trying to vaccinate those in the first wave. Um, it was extremely stressful. We had people calling up and asking why they weren't getting the vaccine before other vaccines. We had, you know, veterinarians calling up and wanting the vaccines. Um, so it was a huge, huge effort. And I'm really pleased that we were able to contribute so significantly to Vermont's high vaccination rate. Um, we moved and retrained staff as we moved them to different areas of the hospitals. We administered monoclonal antibodies. Again, this is really intensive work where you have to stand up, um, you know, put these 
in separate units because we know that all these patients are going to be COVID positive, have it in an infusion center. You also have to sort of triage who gets it because these are all treatments that are limited in supply. And so providers are having to make decisions about who gets uh, this sort of treatment and who needs it the most. And again, extremely time consuming and extremely stressful, um, as well as adapting to new data policy and regulations. So we heard recently about how the vaccine implementation is going to look like, and it is extensive. Um, we are going to have to have records for anyone who comes in, you know, more than twice to our buildings, including people who are doing construction work outside and who eat in our cafeterias. Um, so there is just a lot going on in terms of the COVID emergency response. And here we are today where we have COVID, we have the effects of COVID, but we're also coming out of COVID. Um, and we really are at a breaking point. So as of February 4th, Vermont has the highest percentage of hospitals reporting critical staffing shortages at 64.71%. Um, just as a comparison, New Hampshire's reporting uh, the number of their hospitals that are at this critical staffing level at 6.67%. Um, we're currently utilizing FEMA and Vermont National Guard to help out at the hospital. Well, okay, go good. ahead. Okay. <laughs> Representative Donahue. Really set of percentages. I, yeah. I, I really don't understand it. Can you, can you spend a little more time with <laughs> staffing shortages at 64.71% meaning so That's more than half of our hospitals are saying there are critical staffing shortages. The hospitals report to a federal emergency management database. And the question is, are you at critical staffing shortages? Have you had to change your practices? And um, more than half of Vermont's hospital, hospitals have answered yes to that. Okay, at some point it'd be helpful to know what that means in terms of critical staffing, because I really recognize that. But So that's, that's helpful. So it's, it's not... So I don't want it to be misinterpreted or confused that there's a 64% staffing right. shortage at any hospital in Vermont. That isn't the case. Uh, and that's what I was just, as I, as you look at this and different people present us with data, uh, we've had people saying, well, we have a 30% uh, turnover rate or we have a 40, or, you know, a 25% vacancy rate. And that's not what this percentage is referring to at all. Yeah, no, what this is, this, that is not what this is referring to. This is referring to how many hospitals, the percentage of hospitals in your state who are at critical staffing shortages. So over half of our hospitals are there. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was Vermont at 64.7%. And, um, uh, and then there were hospitals closely after it in the 60s. What we're seeing now is that the nearest hospital after it is at a, about 20%. So fewer hospitals across the nation are at critical staffing shortages. We remain high on critical staffing shortages. Some, at some point, not right now, but I, I'd love to, I mean, it'd just be useful to understand what the, what the underlying criteria are for, quote, reaching that. <laughs> that uh, significant point to be called a critical staffing shortage, yeah. Yeah, I can send you the exact question that we have. Again, it's basically saying, are you right now changing your the way you provide care due to staffing shortages? Yes or no? And so if you say yes, you're a hospital that's reporting a critical staffing shortage. Okay. Um, do, you, do, you time? Can you, do you mind us interrupting you with questions along the way? I no, I don't mind. Representative Goldman, I think, has a question. Thank you. I'm just curious to know your thoughts about the difference between Vermont and New Hampshire, which is pretty stark. Yeah, I was surprised to see that, too. I'm not sure um, uh, what is happening there, but I agree it is pretty stark, and, and they're you know, we're routinely compared, so I, I'm not sure. Is there a way to understand it better? I mean, just so that we can understand the 64% in the context of a, a larger system or larger country. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it could very well be, and again, I'll have to talk to my New Hampshire counterpart, which I did not have a chance to do before today. Um, but as we've talked about before, especially with having eight critical access hospitals, if you have one person who's out, if you have a very, if you have a couple people who are um, not able to staff their position, it can have a huge impact on the hospital and the services that they provide. And I think New Hampshire has quite a few more hospitals than Vermont um, and also larger systems there. Thanks. Um, the other thing that we're, oh, so we are you, because of this uh, critical staffing shortage, um, hospitals are currently utilizing FEMA and the Vermont National Guard. Um, as we've all learned during this pandemic, the uh, healthcare workforce, uh, the, the healthcare clinicians in the National Guard are all within our current workforce that we need to be need to have working, but we have been able to utilize the Vermont, the Vermont National Guard to um, do non-clinical work uh, to try to further free up um, healthcare workforce. So things like bringing food to patients, uh, driving delivery vehicles, maintenance. Um, there are a bunch of different ways the Vermont National Guard are uh, pitching in right now to help with some of our hospitals. Additionally, at our hospitals, there are about 100 people who are waiting in hospital beds for subacute or long-term care placements. Um, so this is in addition to the 130 beds that the state has opened using contracted nursing um, at some of our skilled nursing facilities. So when we hear about things like inefficient care or low value care, I feel like this is right there. This is, um, this is the wrong care in the wrong place. Um, these people are looking to go to more subacute care and instead they're in a higher level of care and they have been there for months and months potentially. Um, and so this is an area where we really need help going forward and we don't see this getting better as we go forward because the workforce issue causes such a ripple effect for hospitals. So when we don't have enough workforce in our long-term care facilities or in home health, then um, it you know, backs up into our hospitals. Again, as we've seen in mental health too, where we have people waiting in, pe in places that they shouldn't be waiting and it affects our capacity as well. There's also, as you well know, 35 people who are waiting in emergency departments for mental health placement. Uh, and we've, we've also heard that due to lack of respite care, there are individuals being drop, dropped off in emergency departments with no emergent medical needs, but there's no place else for them to go. And so they're in the emergency departments that are also extremely stressed right now. Um, we have had in the recent past, I think it's gotten better at this point, but we've had emergency department physicians calling up to 40 hospitals to transfer patients, transfers that really should have taken minutes because they were so critical to health are taking hours. And we have hospital nurses riding in ambulances because we have a lack of paramedics. So when there isn't a paramedic on board, but a paramedic is needed, a nurse will leave the emergency de department and leave it. Uh, and go on to the ambulance. And because we're transferring longer, that could take a really long amount of time to, again, impacting the quality of care providing and impacting the healthcare system. And I know we all want to just get COVID over with and get out of this, but we're really facing an uncertain landscape right now. So we have our workforce crisis, we have the subacute crisis, we have the mental health crisis, um, we have hospitals reporting that patients are coming in sicker than they normally would. When we've talked to hospitals about a lot of people being in emergency departments, we've asked them if they should really be in urgent care and they've said no. Um, we've seen that COVID is potentially creating another crisis where people didn't get their screening and so there could be an influx of cancer patients. 
There's also new findings about long-term cardiovascular effects that could be a result of COVID, which could also uh, make an impact on our system. And then um, just to add to that is the warning from President Biden about potential cyber attacks from Russia. And so we've seen what happens when there's a cyber attack on one of our hospitals. It really does impact our system um, in, a big way, in a big way, and it can happen for a very long time. So we are very fragile right now, and uh, we've been finding, you know, all of the surrounding ideas out there are not helping us form a uh, sort of predictable, sustainable path going forward out of COVID. Uh, these are some of the things that we've been fielding just this week. Um, and they are not all working in tandem. In fact, a lot of them are working against each other. So we're talking about global bu budgets today. Um, Senate Health and Welfare was talking about reference pricing, which would take out 16 million from the hospital system. Again, last year, our margin was 3 million. Um, at the same time, folks want us to look more into access to specialty care and what we can do to increase the amount of specialty care that's offered. Um, but we should also be investing more in primary care, but we're not going to increase premiums with that. Um, so that will likely result in cuts and reimbursement to specialty care. Um, and then we have sustainability planning where we're going to look at what services um, are considered low value and what services uh, should be provided where across the state. Um, and at the same time that we're doing that, we should also be investing more resources into partnering with higher education on workforce. And we're just going to plain have to do more in workforce there um, unless we get a significant amount of help from the state. So all of these um, are you know, some of these are a little bit mutually exclusive. They're all pulling us in different directions. They all have different goals or not always the same goal. And so it is really difficult for us to figure out where we go from here uh, when we're already coming out of COVID pretty fragile. So we do think that this is a good time to rebuild and reset and, and work with Vermont to get on the same page of what our goals are and where we should be going with our healthcare system. Uh, VAS supports building uh, some uh, sort of consensus from the ground up um, with a community-driven process uh, as a vision of how to strengthen Vermont's healthcare system. We I think we're really well positioned to do this. We have our, our um, community health needs assessment and uh, those sorts of avenues to get community feedback. And so we want to be at the table for that. But we do think a new payment model needs to include hospitals as part of uh, the governance process and to inform decision making. So like I said, hearing consultants say that we aren't doing enough or that we don't share services or um, that we provide low value care, um, we wanna be able to talk about what's actually happening on the ground, how either we're sharing services with other hospitals or that we are employing part-time physicians who actually do a lot of um, procedures elsewhere. We wanna provide that nuance that uh, consultants can't always get to uh, in the short amount of time that they're working on Vermont issues. Do you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, you? yes. So let me, I, I wanna be clear. Um, as you perhaps know, last week or the week before, the Green Mountain Care Board presented its report on sustainability. And from what I understand, what you're saying is you're on board with that. You agree with the Green Mountain Care Board's plans to move ahead. Is that correct? I am saying that now is a good time to hear from our communities about what they need from their healthcare system. Um, and that is what the Green Mountain Care Board has said. I agree that that's a discussion that we need to have. Um, 
And I want to start from a place of, you know, talking to the community and seeing what they need as opposed to uh, a top down sort of situation of move these beds over here, move these beds over there. So I, th I think well, we'll, we'll come back to hearing because I think I think what Representative Page may be representing, and I don't want to speak for him, but that there's actually some overlap, significant overlap in your vision of, of getting to absolutely uh, the, a sustainable system. But the Gray yeah. Mountain Care Board did talk about reaching out to communities, and uh, I just picked up on that yeah. and thought that's pretty much what what you're saying. So therefore, you're in agreement. But obviously... I mean, quite frankly, quite frankly, Representative Page, if it, it seems like this is the direction the committee is going in, we want to make sure that we are there and able to have a voice. But if you wanted to put that three to five million dollars into what is going to happen to the subacute, the people who are waiting for subacute beds in our hospitals or towards mental health, we'd more than support that as well. Okay. Well, let me just say for the record, I was one individual representative here that did not favor the plans for the Green Mountain Care Board. So anyway, it's just my two cents. Well, let's, 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 let's hear the rest of the presentation and then we'll and hear from the Green Mountain Care Board and then we're going to have opportunity for much more discussion. And, and I don't see us making a, just any kind of decision here today as such, but this is really an opportunity to ask a lot more questions and hear from the hospital association. So. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Dan. Great, thanks. Um, so, like I said, we are willing to have that discussion about value-based care. Um, we we want to be sustainable too. We don't want to sit here and say we don't want our hospitals to uh, survive. We um, we want to make sure that there's a way for them to stay here and serve Vermonters too. So. We do want to be a part of that discussion. We do want to manage expectations around what value-based care means for people um, so that we all have a shared understanding of that. So value-based care provides incentives for preventive care and better health, health outcomes, um, which is the direction we want to move in, right? We've been saying this for a long time. This is what we said with the Alpair model. We want to provide better health outcomes for our patients. We don't want to be hoping for a bad flu season so that uh, that will bring in revenue for us, right? We all agree that fee-for-service is um, uh, not the way to better health necessarily. So we do wanna be a part of that conversation. But I wanna manage uh, expectations around um, you know, this and affordability, especially when our system is so lean as it is now. So it will not result in instantaneous premium reductions or anything like that. The Pennsylvania model that the Green Mountain Care Board has been discussing has a very um, you know, modest target of 35 million in savings over seven years. This is much more about taking um, taking, aligning the incentives so that they move towards preventive health and less towards this is going to reduce your premiums tomorrow. What it's going to do is provide better health so that uh, the cost of healthcare would hopefully go down over decades um, because the prevention that we do now will help later. Um, but most of all, we need predictable and sustainable model going forward and a pre predictable and sustainable direction going forward. Um, right now, with all the ideas that are swirling around um, and all of the sort of priorities that are swirling around, I think uh, whatever our hospitals can invest in, they're not going to be able to invest in long term because it's unclear where we're going. Um, we're, of course, going to invest in workforce right now um, and more immediate things. but. Um, it's really difficult for us to think about long-term investments where we have competing um, goals uh, coming at us from different directions. In terms of how to immediately impact the system, um, in, um, 
one thing, and I just took the slide right from the Green Mountain Care Board's presentation. I'm sorry, Elena and Susan and Kevin. I hope you don't mind. I should ask you permission. Um, but but I think this slide really helps illustrate uh, that what would help and have an immediate impact on our healthcare system and help it so that the price doesn't increase as quickly for our commercial uh, in our commercial payer or commercial insurer consumers um, is an increase in Medicaid reimbursement and a more sustainable Medicaid reimbursement. And um, when I talk about that, I, I do talk about that, not just for hospitals, certainly for hospitals, but also system wide, because um, as I just mentioned, uh, we're seeing the impact of what happens when there's underfunded Medicaid for our long term care services. So um, really the most sort of immediate helpful impact to hospitals and the rest of the healthcare system would be through increased Medicaid rates and more sustainable Medicaid rates. And that's, that's where we were going earlier in the session when I came and talked about workforce and investing in workforce. That those increased investments, they go to the, the commercial rates. And that's, that's the sort of only release valve that we have at this point. And so, so this is why a sustainable Medicaid reimbursement would, would help us the most. Uh, so I'll just say it again, sustainable Medicaid reimbursement, it would be immediate impact for us. And then also looking at care coordination and setting us up for success in that value-based direction, whether it's continuing with the current all-pair model or uh, uh, other sort of value-based models. Um, I think it's worth putting the care coordination in the hands of the providers at this point. We know that payers have a lot of care coordination efforts, and um, we think it'd be helpful to shift those resources over to providers. So finally, just once more, um, our recommendations are community-driven process to determine local needs. Um, we need to address waiting in hospitals for mental health patients and the subacute beds. Um, those are our most immediate needs right now, and again, that's the most sort of um, wrong care in the wrong place uh, issue that we need to address. And then having a hospital voice in the development and government of the value-based model, not just listening to consultants, but having hospitals at the table in a formal way. And then uh, provider-based care coordination framework, uh, shifting the provider resources that we now see with the payers over to providers, as well as a sustainable Medicaid reimbursement. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much for having me. I will stop sharing so I can see everyone. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and I, as, as I think it'd be fair to say that's, there's a lot more to be said about much of what you've outlined here as well, this is, uh, but I think it's helpful to have you lay out some of the broad and specific challenges that the hospital system in Vermont is facing uh, at this point in time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna just not comment further at this point because I think it'd be useful because we also we did hear from the Green Mountain Care Board initially in their presentation. Um, and we felt like because it had specifically because it also had a budget request item along with it that we while we had not had the opportunity to delve as deeply into the sustainability issues that we wanted to hear more from the Green Mountain Care Board about what given their analysis and the proposal that they're putting forward uh, to ask them to say more about what you're asking for. Uh, two to five million dollars for a process of moving towards global budgeting and uh, for hospitals. And we wanted to give them a chance. We wanted to ask them, it's like, well, say more because that's, we don't feel like we've heard enough. Uh, we need to understand what, you know, what, what it is that 
we would be doing with that. And again, I think it's also tied to the general proposal uh, of the analysis and the conclusions that would lead to that request. So I'm going to, uh, I see we have a number of folks from the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm going to turn to Kevin just at least to get us started as the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. And then Kevin, I'll welcome you to uh, have others participate or however you wish to proceed. And uh, again, if it's okay, we'll ask some questions along the way. Uh, and I think we've allowed enough time that we can have questions and not feel like we're cutting off either of your presentations. So. Yeah, just fire away at any time. For the record, Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. And uh, joining me today are Susan Barrett, the Executive Director, Elena Barraby, who is working on um, the sustainability project, and um, Gene Stetter, just in case there were other budget questions. Um, we weren't quite sure from the email if you uh, might... Uh, Go into other questions so we wanted to be prepared so that's the team that's with me today and um before i i start on the the five million dollar request that we have for sustainability i just want to say that um i agree with everything that devon has just um said to you and the reality is is that we would hope that our our request for the five million isn't competing against other needs that are out there so, for example, on the um, workforce, when I testified with your colleagues in the um, House Commerce Committee, you know, they had done some analysis on some uh, New England states, and, and it was a lot more dollars that were being spent there. And, and I told them I hadn't done an analysis of the New England states, but I had listened very patiently to Governor Hochul in New York on her $10 billion healthcare workforce initiative. And obviously, New York's a much bigger state, but when you divide that out by the 22 plus million people in uh, New York, it works out to about $494 for every person in the state of Vermont. You do that same math in Vermont, and you get about 315 million that would be the equivalent investment in healthcare workforce. And yet, from what I've been able to uh, ascertain so far from the budget in the discussions, it looks like it's probably closer to 40 million that will be spent in Vermont. But, you know, I could be missing something. It's very hard. And as you know, it's, uh, it's even hard sometimes for legislators to keep track of everything that's going on in the building. But uh, that's what, what I'm aware of. And, and I would just say I met with um, Devon's board yesterday and they're tired, they're beaten down. It's been a tough couple of years. And yet, um, I still sensed a, a sense of willingness to work together. And we totally agree that it should be a, a community driven process and not top down. And um, I wasn't involved in the negotiations of the current model, but it was always meant to be um, provider led. And in fact, if you look at any of the descriptions of the um, all payer model agreement, it's a provider led agreement. It's not a government led agreement. And so um, Devin also mentioned um, uh, adequate uh, uh, subacute or step down beds and uh, subacute uh, is something we're keenly aware of. Uh, one of the things that has been a huge bottleneck for our hospitals has been um, for monitors who are literally trapped in emergency rooms waiting for um, inpatient acute psych beds and uh, you know, that's not proper care. And if we're truly going to have parity between mental and physical health, we would never tolerate somebody with a broken leg being stuck in an emergency room for, you know, days or weeks at a time. And yet um, we're at that point. And, you know, we took and did an enforcement action against UVM several years ago that would require them to invest in um, inpatient acute psych beds. And that process got slowed down and halted by two factors. One, that the numbers came in too high initially, and number two, the pandemic. But they're back uh, working on that, and they'll be submitting a CON um, this spring. And I just, I'm very, very worried from the outside looking in at it that there could be a train wreck here because I hear from um, advocates that feel that they haven't had enough sufficient stay 
say on a community system. And so we've passed that feedback along to uh, UVM and we hope that's uh, working, but um, for any mental health system to, to work, there has to be that community-based system. And, and we at the Green Mountain Care Board can't solve all those problems. Um, we're trying to do our part by trying to make sure that there are um, sufficient inpatient acute beds, but we, we need help from the legislature to make sure that the community system is there. And we hear that uh, constantly. And one of the things that takes up the acute beds is when you can't place someone in a subacute um, setting. And so it's, it's all pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So we would, we would not be able to sleep at night if we thought that um, the 5 million that we were asking for was competing for those type of dollars. And, and we hope it's not. What we're trying to get is uh, a crack at one-time dollars that might be able to um, create the conversations system-wide about how we can do better and um, move towards more um, value and away from volume. So uh, I just wanna make it clear that um, some people may think that uh, um, we're testifying differently than what Devin has said and we're not. I think we're saying the same thing and, and as far as government reimbursement, um, we have been the strongest uh, voices on saying that you can't balance all the needs just on the commercial payers because as Mike Fisher will tell you that, you know, Vermonters are struggling to pay for their insurance today. And um, it was very clear to me yesterday that um, Devon's board um, is really hoping that if government isn't there to help pay for all the workforce needs that they're seeing, and they have to do it anyways, that um, we would uh, take care of that in, in commercial. And I had to push back because I just can't see how, uh, you know, a huge double digit increase in commercial rates is gonna benefit anyone because all it's gonna do is make more people uninsured or underinsured. So um, I'm in agreement with everything she said. With that being said, the only way that we really have a, a good healthcare system in the long haul and make sure that we don't see hospitals having to close their doors is to begin to have this conversation on sustainability. And so with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over first to um, Elena to walk through the uh, $5 million ask and uh, just throw out questions as we go. All right, thank you. So I will share my screen. Can you see a table? Yes. Uh, it's small, but I think we many of us have it on our own devices yeah. as well. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Um, so this uh, kind of builds on the presentation that we went through last week um, and details the $5 billion for the recommendation number one. Um, and I think recommendation number three is Devin alluded to sustainable Medicaid payments kind of goes with this. Like you, re you really won't see that translation into kind of the commercial rate without this global payment on top of that. So I think there is some nuance there to think through. Um, but the global payments, um, you know, first, you know, just to remind everyone what global payments are. They're fixed, often prepaid amounts of funding for a certain period of time for a specified population rather than fixed rates for individual okay, services. Can I just say, Elena, Elena yes. it's, at least in the committee room, it's a little hard to hear if you could oh, okay. be closer okay. to the mic or something. And slow down. And slow yeah, down. Yeah, it's not just yeah. the committee room. I'm having a tough time hearing you too, Elena. Is this yeah, better? Maybe to slow down the rapid rate of <laughs> Very slow and loud. Slow, slow and loud. And I can loud. do that. Okay. <laughs> So global payments are this allowance, right, that we would provide to hospitals that would free them from having to think about volume um, in order to bring in revenues. Um, so there are many ways to operationalize global payments. Um, in some states, I think, you know, Devin alluded to this in Pennsylvania, um, their global payment is set up to focus on rural hospitals and to maintain sustainability. In Maryland, their global payment model is focused on curbing cost growth. So they're coming at it from different angles. They have different mechanisms for establishing the amounts and for paying hospitals. Um, so I don't think either of these models can be picked up and replicated in Vermont, but I think there's something to be learned from each of them. 
um, and to think about what this could look like to work in Vermont specifically. And that's um, why the community uh, facilitation is so important because it needs to be a Vermont based model. And if you take a look at where Maryland started with the high costs that were uh, seen in Maryland, um, the hospitals are right. Vermont is starting in a different place. And so whatever model is developed in Vermont has to work for Vermont. It's, it's not a model that can be picked up and used in Maryland or Pennsylvania or any other state. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, really speaks to the first step that would need to happen to, to really move this work forward. And that's to establish goals for the Vermont Hospital Global Payment. Um, so, you know, we've talked through the sustainability planning work on what, you know, we think are particularly important goals, but I think there's, you know, more work to do to solidify that and get a concrete, not too, not a laundry list, but a couple succinct goals that we could work towards and include in this payment um, as this sort of, as this to be designed. Um, so certainly hospital solvency, um, where, where volumes are low is a big concern, supporting equitable access for all Vermonters um, to high quality care. Um, what does that look like and how could a payment support that? Um, moderating total cost of care growth. So care happens in the hospital, but also outside the hospital and there's a relationship there. So while this would be focused on hospitals, we need to understand the impact on the broader um, delivery system and how care will be utilized. Um, and then we need to recognize varying community needs. And I think that's a key theme that, that many of us share. So I, that should be centered to this work. Um, the second step would be Oscar, to work. Can we pause for a question? Yes. I, you need to, I think we need to need to kind of stay in touch with whether there's questions right, so that I'm not cutting you off in mid sentence okay. if possible. Mm -hmm. But I think Paige has a question or to, to pose. Is that right? Yes. Are there any other? Speak up, Whitty. Are there any other states besides Maryland and Pennsylvania that are doing global payments? Um, there are different ways of thinking about global payments. These are just the like kind of the biggest, most comprehensive models. Um, so we could look for other. Go ahead, Susan. I think yeah, you were... I believe Rhode Island's legislature yes. is pursuing this, and I know that um, we could share some of the details um, that they're working on. That's the only other one um, that I that comes to mind for me. Right, at this time. Right. And do we have a, do we know how long this has been going on with Pennsylvania and Maryland? Do we have a track record for these two yeah. states? So, so Maryland's been going longer, but Pennsylvania has only been going for a couple of years. And Pennsylvania is different than Maryland in that Pennsylvania is a rural model. And what uh, the federal um, partners are looking for there is trying to, um, because there have been so many rural hospitals that have closed across the country, how, how do you get sustainability in a rural environment? And so um, that is a true rural model. And whenever we talk with people in Washington, um, when they talk about equity, they talk about equity in a lot of different ways and they even include rurality in that discussion of equity. And, and, and one final uh, question, Chair Mullen or whoever, um, do we have any records of how many rural hospitals have closed in Pennsylvania? I mean, how successful have they been in sustaining our rural hospitals in Pennsylvania? I will say, sorry, I, I talked to my counterpart in Pennsylvania this week and the none of the hospitals have closed. Um, it is a voluntary program, uh, the Pennsylvania model. And so those hospitals join voluntarily. And, and, and will, will Vermont be voluntary? That will depend on what's decided in the community conversations. I mean, we don't want to prejudge Representative Page what the Vermont model will look like. If we're doing that, then we're, we don't even need to have the conversation. We're just designing it ourselves. and. Nobody would buy into that period. It, it has to be a, uh, a model that's developed by people in the field and they have to be comfortable with where it's headed. Thank you for saying that, appreciate it. Right. And we need to understand the implications of certain design elements and what that means. Elena, don't forget to speak up and get close. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's very hard yeah. when you're 
they were not able to hear. So. All right. Can you hear me now? Are we good to go on? We can. And just uh, for the committee members, when I had a meeting with her earlier, she was loud and clear, but she was broadcasting from her basement and maybe it's the change of location. <laughs> <I'm fine. laughs> yeah, I'll go back to the basement next time. Um, okay. So I think, so that second piece, I think, you know, we talked about hiring consultants, but working with our communities and making sure that the, that we consider a number of design options and really understand the implications of you know, various um, approaches to doing this work. Um, so this design work would inform whether statutory changes were necessary um, in the next legislative session and any additional resources. So th these dollars that we're, we've proposed here are really just to get the conversation going and to come up with some designs and some options that could then be implemented. And can I just add very, very quickly here, when we say we, um, it is the state of Vermont, um, especially when it when talking about the federal agreement. And just to be clear, we work with the executive branch, the governor and AHS, and they are leading the negotiations on the next model. Um, certainly, we 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 at the Green Mountain Care Board would not be able to go to the federal government on our own. And so, working with our partners here in Vermont and then working with our federal partners uh, in order to work um, to bring Medicare into what, whatever we land on as, a, as a Vermont will be essential. Right. And so how can I just say? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. It, it, would, it would be helpful at some point, Susan or Kevin, to share with us what kind of interactions you've had with the executive branch about this proposal as well, so that we're not uh, having a conversation just with ourselves and with Vaz, but knowing that there's a part of this that's, that there's a critical role to play for the executive branch as well. So someone could give us some sense of that. Maybe we can ask the them The conversations ourselves. have been mainly with the Director of Healthcare Reform, Ina Backus, and just briefing her on this and, uh, um, at this at this point, she has been um, somewhat supportive and uh, believes it, it's an option that should be explored. She hasn't jumped on and said, this is what the administration believes should happen. So I don't want you to believe that that's the case. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Goldman has a question. I'm not sure if you've gotten um, this far down the road, but I'm wondering about a little bit of a sort of imagination case study. Um, of how you might spend the summer in a certain location. Um, you know, I live in the Springfield Hospital area. So have you been able to give any thoughts to be a little more concrete on how you might operationalize this for us? And that might be too, you might be way, you may not be there yet. But we are not there we're, yet. Yeah, I think we're kind of struggling on how to see it. it, um, it how, 1.4 million, you know, I know a lot of it is actuarial. I don't know how much of that is actuarial and how much is community-based. What we're envisioning is um, an effort led by um, a professional facilitator um, with medical experience so that um, people like yourself um, will understand that the facilitator understands what their lives are like. and. Um, begin those conversations. And I would say they would start initially, probably, and again, this is just shooting from the hip, so I always get in trouble when I do this, but initially those conversations in the community would start with um, the leadership at a, the local hospital and their board, and then be rolled out to a much broader based community conversation. But that's just me shooting from the hip about how it, it might work. And after, if we're successful in uh, achieving these funds and we hire a facilitator, they may tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about, which is not unusual. So I think that is that it's more on the three million side when we're going to be out in communities talking about delivery system reform. On the 1.4 million side, I think that's really looking at payments and making sure that the payments are going to work in a way 
for each of our hospitals. So there's that will be iterative, but again, there will be actuaries. It's going to be a lot of accounting work and looking at historical trends. Um, but I think on that 3 million side, what that looks like, you know, there's still going to need to be some data gathering and analysis. I think we have a, a lot of data, but I think there's still a lot of gaps. We need to understand what we're looking at. We need hospitals at the table to help us, you know, identify other data that we have not looked at that would be helpful for advancing this work. Um, and then we need to identify characteristics of high performing health systems in rural contexts and kind of you know, share that vision um, and get, you know, the local vision, you know, and try to synthesize these ideas. So I think there's this, you know, what is possible and trying to understand what we could be doing that we're not and then engaging in those conversations. Um, and that, and that's, you know, part of that last, the, la the last tranche of work there at the bottom of the sheet, that $3 million. Um, and that's really, you know, while the Green Mountain Care Board will be focused on the hospital aspect of delivery system reform, there, we will likely learn a lot more about other opportunities to change and to advance our delivery system reform efforts um, that may require further legislation or that may require um, AHS to respond or other parties. So thinking about how, um, what healthcare looks like in schools or mental health, those are all areas that are likely going to come up um, and we are happy to document. We think it makes sense to document, but I'm not sure that the amount of money we're asking for here or our authority would allow us to kind of go beyond the hospital um, owned services. So I just wanted that to be clear as well. Sorry that I jumped ahead. <laughs> no, that's, great. that's and we can I, I'll add to as we um, progress, you know, we would we would have that information. And I like the idea of a case, a case study, as you said, Representative Goldman. So that's helpful. Thank you. I'm not clear where you are in your presentation to us at this point. <laughs> All right, so we, we've talked about the 1.4 million, which is for designing the global payment. Then there's the 600,000 that Susan described that would support Medicare's inclusion in the um, subsequent proposal for the state's next agreement with CMMI. That's kind of bigger than the board that we'd also need the administration and AHS to, to recognize this as a path forward. And then the 3 million, which is to engage um, communities in discussing what delivery system reform should look like in order to ensure that we have a high quality, efficient system um, for which the global payment would be paying for. So, um, you know, what those are kind of the three streams of work. They all kind of go together, <laughs> they need each other. Um, you know, we can't really have a global payment on top of a, on a, you know, on an inefficient system. So making sure that we're deploying our resources, you know, we've seen a lot of improvement, but there's still a lot of room to go. If we look at kind of avoidable utilizations um, and, you know, low value care, as Devin mentioned, you know, a lot of this will be long-term, but there are some, there's opportunity. I think we heard during the um, VAS press conference yesterday, there are a lot of workforce challenges that are linked to wait times. I think if we think about, you know, tackling some of those issues as part of this redesign work, um, you know, that would be really, I think, helpful for a lot of these streams of work that are seemingly disparate, but quite integrated. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think this could go a long way. Uh, Representative Peterson has a question. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for the presentation so far, anyway. Um, I, I want to talk about the scope of this. Um, when we talk about hospital, it, it seems to me, in looking at this, that you're talking about the entire healthcare system from stem to stern. The uh, like I have a, a PA, I go to working in a separate office, but it seems like all that stuff would get changed. Is that right or no? Is this just hospital that changes? 
And, and does that include people that uh, work in other buildings but get there but are affiliated with the hospital? How, how what's the scope of of the change? I think that's a great question. I think this is up to the communities, right? Like we we are not going. The board only has authority over hospitals through its hospital budget authority and rate setting. Um, so beyond that, the board. In a, as part of a board process, that's the scope. But I think there's a lot of opportunity that might be identified through these conversations for other changes that would be helpful. Hospitals, again, are one piece of delivery system reform efforts that are required. They're kind of a major piece. Um, and so that's why it makes sense to focus there, particularly with our hospital sustainability challenges. You know, I think that's kind of where we've identified a, a, a major threat um, that's increasing, particularly if our federal leaf funds dry up or when they dry up. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't other avenues that are important to consider and to invest in, but you know, this is where we were asked to take a look and where our authority lies. And I'll just add to, I think that's a great question, Representative Peterson, we, we also, um, you know, we know that, and Devin will probably agree, and I, and I thought of this as she was talking about everything the hospitals have done for Vermont over the last two years and everything the people who work in those hospitals have done. I'm going to get emotional. It's been a long two years. Um, but we cannot let these hospitals fail. We need them. And that's why we're here. We, we cannot experience another Springfield. And, and so we start with the hospitals, but we all know that hospitals are, are just such a huge part of their community. They're often the largest employer there. Um, you know, I go back to Springfield. If they did not have their emergency room, where would those, those community members go? Um, and so, so we, we start there, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to impact, it's going to impact the community because the community relies on those hospitals. Hopefully that this type of a change would be an incentive to have even better communications, whether it's an independent doctor or right. a doctor who is through a hospital system, because at the end of the day, it uh, um, would benefit everyone if people are healthy and not sick. So one of the things, so for example, yesterday, we had a great presentation from um, the staff of uh, Blueprint about a program that they run on uh, diabetes management and, and it's open to all Vermonters. And yet we know that most Vermonters don't even know about the program. And those are the type of conversations that we would hope would uh, be happening so that, um, I mean, that is a chronic illness that if it's treated early is gonna be um, more cost effective than letting it uh, build. It, it, you know, it's, those are the type of things that we would hope that there'd be better care coordination, that there'd be better communication. Um, but, you know, that yeah. will depend upon the community itself in the, in the long haul because they are the ones who, once a plan is um, designed, will have to carry it out. Well, let me ask you a, a follow up. It's kind of divergent from that question, but but as I sit here thinking about and, and looking at the um, handout or the, the the screen here, how who do you find? Um, that can come in and do this redesign? How, what people, are there people experienced in this? Are there contract agencies who deal in this? Uh, I see this being quite a number of people going in and analyzing everything in your hospitals and then having to redesign uh, computer systems and all that cost. I, so I assume you're talking uh, labor, and, and systems upgrade being where the 5 million will go. Um, but I don't know that. Yeah, there, there are a number of healthcare consultants uh, throughout the country and um, different firms have different expertise. Um, the biggest expertise that we would be looking for is the community um, facilitation and building skills. And uh, 
you know, I, I've personally been at conferences where um, different doctors have uh, presented. And I, I think that there's a pool of talent out there that would be able to facilitate the conversations in the communities. Okay, so you'd hire them, they'd come in, do the work, and, and that's how it would go. We'd, uh, we'd, we'd look at the, the systems you came up with and adopt them or not, or whatever. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Kevin, um, I don't want to cut anybody else off with the question, but uh, so I'm, as I'm listening to both uh, Devin's presentation and from the board, Green Mountain Care Board, what I'm hearing you say is like, okay, the Green Mountain Care Board has been charged with responsibility for hospital budgets. That's where your authority lies with regard to this specifically, and that you've been doing that for some period of time as a board, working to use the authority that you have to try to uh, sustain, to try to support the healthcare system, the, the hospital systems of Vermont. But that fundamental to what you have as authority and what the structure has is the underlying fee-for-service system still. That is the underpinning of the financial structures of, 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 of medical services generally, but hospitals, including all hospitals. And that the hospitals have been participating to some extent in the transition or transformation to value-based payments and express support for moving in that direction. But what I'm hearing is that a sense of we're not moving fast enough to achieve the kind of transformation that we need to, to, to avert the, the unintended uh, fiscal fi financial challenges and, and not just financial challenges, but the challenges that then fall to the communities and to Vermonters if a, if a hospital is struggling or if it fails. It goes um, back to that, uh, that old, exactly. uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, and, and I think key to this is that you are holding out that global budgeting for hospitals is an alternative framework to think about how to sustain the financial viability of our hospital system. That, that, and that, that turns its, that accelerates and actually completely moves toward a different financial uh, paradigm for funding hospitals, taking all of the monies that are involved, including you're asking for, you know, if, if the government, if the federal government will participate with Medicare, that including rolling Medicare into that transformed financial funding of hospital services. And, and I think I think part of where I get where it gets a little confusing is because then we also talk about, well, we're going to go upstream and we're going to prevent things and we're going to save people from having the difficult medical conditions they have. And, and frankly, we've talked about that in lots of different ways with the Blueprint for Health. We've talked about that with, I mean, everybody talks about that when they come in to talk about, I've got a new prevention program. And as Jane Kitchell has said, and uh, others who've chaired the Appropriations Committee, if I had, if I, if I could save all the money that people say we're going to save by giving them their money, well, we would have saved all kinds of money, but it doesn't actually it doesn't happen in a time frame where you actually save the money that you're going to spend right now. And I think there's a, for me, there's a little bit of disconnect between the saving of money by doing all the prevention work and the urgency of moving to a global payment model, which one is urgent and the other is long-term and and both both can be true. The both are important. It can be true, which I which I understand. But they're not in sync with each other in terms of the kind of transformation that is achievable. We're not going to we're not going to have that kind of savings in the short term mm -hmm. with long term prevention. It's it's actually where we all want to end up. Yeah, but it's it not going to happen. Years, and that's same. part of the reason why we. Um, you know, people struggle with trying to fund any programs that go after the social determinants of health, right. because the payoff on that 
could take a lifetime. And oh. um, that that is the uh, struggle. But picture that in people have come to agreement today in Vermont that we need to move away from volume to value. But we're still stuck in a system where some payers are making the providers reconcile to a fee-for-service world. And it's not true capitation. So if you don't have true capitation, you're still doing that unnecessary, what I would call administrative work that doesn't have anything to do with direct health care for any Vermonters to make sure that you get paid. And this would, in my mind, alleviate some of the need for um, the chasing of the dollars. So it, I think that it would be a, a system-wide simplification and a system-wide um, focus on what's best for the patient. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to Representative Black and then Representative Peterson or others who haven't spoken if you wish to speak before. So oh, thank you everyone who's spoken. I, I mean, this is very alluring. I understand that. I just, I'm wondering if you, if anybody wants to speak to this, that if you feel as though moving to a global payment system, hospital payment system would mean consolidation would be more or less likely under that scenario, because I worry about consolidation. I think what you would see, and I wouldn't call it um, consolidation, I think you would see more collaboration. And um, I think I used this example in your committee once before, but I'll use it again. Um, during the troubles that uh, um, Springfield was going through, one of the proposed solutions was, um, to have an alignment with Dartmouth. And what the proposal was, was to have three hospitals with one management team so that Montescutney, Springfield and Valley Regional had one CEO, one CNO, one CFO, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of collaboration that um, I would hope to see. And if you're close to other hospitals, does each one of you have to um, do everything or can you have agreements with each other so that there can be a center of excellence for whatever that particular um, scope of medicine is in, in one hospital in a different center of excellence for a different scope of medicine in a, in a nearby hospital. So those are the type of things that I think would be possible. Um, I, I certainly, don't envision having one player gobbling up all the entities in Vermont. That that certainly is nothing that I've thought about. And I, I think we need to remember the alternative, right? So if hospitals continue to decline, their financial health continues to decline, they close, they affiliate, they what are their options? So I think remembering that counterfactual is really important. Um, and then, you know, if this is a financial sustainability, the idea is to preserve access. Hopefully you'd be preserving the entity as well, right? Like I don't, I think these are actually um, related, but in the other sense. And left to market forces that to, to build on what Elena just said, um, these hospitals potentially might have to affiliate or worse, close. So the goal is to sustain the services in the communities. Does that answer your question, Representative Black? Gives me a lot to think about, thank you. Okay. And if I could just add um, Devin Green from Boz, uh, I think a lot of, I think a lot of the answer lays in the, the details of whatever payment gets proposed and, you know, it, it all depends on the, like the Pennsylvania models based on your last three years um, or your last year, whichever's higher. Um, and so we have to think about if that would make sense for 
hospitals here or if we want to do that differently. Um, and also, are there federal dollars available to help us with that transition to more mm -hmm. value-based care? Uh, we didn't see that come to fruition with the first iteration of the all-payer model. And so we have, as a part of that, there's more of this lean system instead of the upfront investment in the preventive care. I can't speak for the board, um, but I know that I have um, heard that some of the board members have said that they would not enter into a, another agreement if that funding wasn't, and I know it was there, Devin and I have come back and forth. It was, it was in global commitment, I believe, um, but it has to be very, those transformation funds must be there for the hospitals. And in Pennsylvania, for example, there was, there is funding for the hospitals. And I just want to say, Maryland, Pennsylvania, we're throwing out these examples. And, and in fact, in Maryland, um, and they've been around since the 80s, somebody had asked how long they've been around. I might be, I might be misquoting, but a very, very long time, it might even been the 70s. Um, they are, they are really built on a fee for service system. And I don't want to get into all the details, but we would want to go forward. We we wouldn't. Um, and again, I, I I can't say exactly where we we would be. That would have to be worked out with the federal government. But Maryland is certainly um, just to say, Devin, that isn't something that I think the feds would be interested in replicating in Vermont. And again, I can't speak for them, but I could imagine they would say that. And Devin, anybody that would propose, uh, um, including 2020 in any type of calculation right. would would be laughed at, I think. <laughs> yeah, at least 2020. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's, let's, I, I'm just gonna let us have the opportunity to just continue to think, talk amongst ourselves with them here as a resource. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that could be that could be useful. And so I'm, I mean, again, I'm welcoming anyone who hasn't spoken, but I'll, 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 I just wanted to follow up. Yeah, no, please, that. please go ahead. OK, so we would have to in order to actually implement something like this, which obviously you're asking for the five million to start the ball rolling, get everything, um, start negotiating. Are we chasing federal dollars? I think what we we're trying to um, do is to make sure that we have some input into Medicare reimbursement. And um, the reason why everybody was so intrigued with the last agreement was that all prior iterations of healthcare reform hadn't envisioned a way to include such a big piece of uh, the dollars in the system, which is Medicare. And so um, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, uh, I would say the main goal is to make sure that we could try to keep all payers in the conversation because if there, some payers are left out, then you still have the chase for the fee-for-service dollars. And that is not a direction that we believe is is helpful. Uh, I, 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 maybe I'm not understanding. I, I mean, essentially, if we enter in, into an agreement with CMS, Medicare, for some sort of alternative payment model, the federal government invests in that payment model within the agreement. Well, I'm... Yeah. I'm and, and so those are additional federal dollars. That's not, you know, fee for service. That would be, a, a, we would have an influx of federal dollars to be able to implement something like this. I would no, say, no, oh, go, ahead. Sure. Was, go ahead, Susan. Oh, sorry. Um, I would say, I think that's what um, Devin was referring to is that it's essential that as we look at continuing to move more and more 
of her members reimbursements to those fixed monthly payments, then we need to make sure that there is um, the, the transformation, that transformation is supported by if Medicare is participating by federal money. Now, the, the issue, and I, I think Kevin made a really good point, the issue today is that, and, and I go back to Elena's picture from last week, I think it was when there was the guy literally standing with one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock. And the, the hospitals right now are in the most difficult position because they have some fixed payments and they have stepped up and they have done the hard work of moving what they can to fixed payments. But, and I think Chair Lippert said it really well by, by first looking at the communities and understanding what, what they want in their community and what they need for their community members that we design a system moving forward for a global payment. And that will allow more, more dollars in those fixed payments for the hospitals. There's really two pieces that, as as I take it, is what Devin is is saying, and she can uh, jump in and correct me if I'm uh, completely wrong. But what I hear, and this goes directly back to, I think, why we didn't have as much success as quickly as we had hoped for with the all-payer model agreement. Um, if you talk to board members who were around at the time, and I wasn't around, but I spoke with Jessica Holmes, and she predicated her affirmative vote in support of uh, signing the contract on the fact that there was going to be hundreds of millions of dollars for delivery system reform, and that didn't happen. And um, so not only do you have to help people change the way they've always done business, but the second, I think, even bigger piece, and Devin, maybe um, I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but I think the, even, the second even bigger piece is you can't get somebody locked into a system where they're doomed for failure from the start. And I'll give you an example, um, I don't know, maybe three decades ago, maybe longer now, um, the federal government um, changed reimbursement towards uh, VNAs, and they just took and locked people in where they were. And so Louisiana that was spending, you know, a six or seven times the amount that Vermont was spending per person. Um, they still had all that money flow and yet Vermont was locked in to a, a very low dollar figure. So Devin, am, am I capturing what I think you're saying? Yeah, no, I think you've got it exactly right. We need a couple different pieces to go forward on this. And, and since we are so lean at the moment, we don't have that ability to move from within ourselves to invest and we would need federal dollars. And part of the issue with the federal dollars was that it took state dollars to draw down the federal dollars. And I think- I'm sitting here remembering, Devin. Part of the, yes, the, the, yes. the catch was it took state dollars to get the federal dollars and, mm -hmm. and people weren't willing to invest the state dollars to, to bring mm -hmm. down the federal dollars. Right. I'm sitting here thinking, that's where the money didn't come from because people yeah. said, we're not willing to do that. Right. And the Green Medicare Board asked for, yep. Yeah, and it, it, and it, became, it became it uh, became then a fight over the general fund mm -hmm. as a match for federal dollars. What year is that? Well, period of years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pre-pandemic, right? <laughs> Definitely pre-pandemic, yeah. oh, right, but well right, before yeah. pre-pandemic. And I mean, seriously, yeah. when they said, the, well, there's transformation dollars available, but oh yeah, but you have to match it with state dollars. And then that state dollars were like felt, it feels like it's being taken from somewhere else. And in fact, That's it right. was being taken somewhere else because there's only so many state dollars. And so I don't know if there's, I mean, I, I can you imagine a, a different scenario where there are federal dollars that aren't having to be matched by state dollars? I, I don't know. I think we could get there. When I talked to my Pennsylvania counterpart, she had said, um, because they had gotten some federal dollars, but not enough either. And so it sounded like one lesson that the feds have taken from that is that there is 
a need for an infusion of federal dollars. So I don't think it's a guarantee, but I think we're closer than where we have been in the past in terms of getting that federal funding for the transformation. Uh, Representative Goldman, then uh, I want to weigh in again at some point. <laughs> My question is actually quick. I just, I think um, and really, mm -hmm. Kevin, um, you keep talking about lean, but some people think lean is good. And could you talk about how maybe lean isn't so good in this case? Because that's what I'm taking for it. When we're looking at that margin slide, that's pretty So small. much lean you can afford. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, and I guess I, you're right. Lean is not maybe the word. I think the, a better word is probably fragile, right? And I think we need to, going forward, strike a balance between uh, having and and... <laughs> It has been so illustrative this week when we talk about wait times for specialists and primary care and global budgets and all of these various things. We really need to, as a state, figure out our goals around affordability, access, and quality and figure out where that line is. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind, particularly for hospitals, is that along with a uh, healthcare provider function, we're also the key partner in terms of emergency management and emergency response function as well. And so, and we're in a rural state. So there's only so far lean will take us without uh, impacting access or impacting our response when an emergency comes up. I've got a question. Uh, can I jump in, Chair? Sure. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. I, I'm going to just indulge. We have. I'm going to say we can take another 15 minutes at the outside, but to the degree, I, there's something in my view. There's something valuable about us being able to actually talk with each other and question each other in a way rather than just hearing testimony and then not being able to engage. So, to the degree you're willing to continue indulging us, this I think it's actually a plus. We're so willing. I, from, from what I hear here, you know, to me, it's relatively exciting that we're looking at trying to do something different. I'm wondering though about the provider, uh, the doctor, uh, nursing staff, um, without a fee for service, uh, is this gonna mean, uh, you're gonna get buy-in from the provider, I guess. Maybe, maybe they'll love it, I don't know, but they're obviously a big part of the whole equation. And I wonder if preliminary talk of I and mean, maybe they've probably known about this for years, I don't know, but no. could you explain to me what, how they look at it? Well, I'll, do you wanna jump in, Devin? Or, I mean, you represent a- I mean, I, so I'll just say again, it's what, what are the terms of whatever we do next? So I think my message, if you take away anything today, the message is that our healthcare system is fragile and we need to tread carefully going forward. Um, so, and, and hear from our communities about what direction we wanna go in. So um, I think, I think the provider buy-in will depend on that community engagement and having hospitals and providers at the table to explain what's going on at the ground level. Um, and also, you know, the terms of any agreement going forward and the availability to change um, the way that you practice, because this is what we're fundamentally asking providers to do. We're asking uh, orthopedists to not necessarily recommend surgery right away, but to send someone to uh, physical therapy first and, and to fundamentally change the way they do business. And I think, as you all know, if you try to, you know, if you get a new iPad or if you get, if something changes in your day, um, a lot of those changes are really hard to implement and we would need we would need significant resources to do that sort of change management going forward. And I think that building on that, the communities, just that that urgency to work with the communities, I, I just wanna say the obvious, which I think everyone in these rooms understands, 
the hospitals haven't had a chance to to be uh, you know in working with the with us and the communities and a potential consultant because we all know how busy busy they've been we want that opportunity and i think that is essential and that's the urgency is to work with the hospitals to work with the communities i mean that that is step one and i don't see the hospitals and the green mountain care board on that point very far apart and then i would also just say a provider that actually is not chasing those fee for service dollars and being push to, you know, you got to, you got to see another patient, another patient, and has the ability to focus on the things that keep patients well. I mean, that's, that's the ethos of value-based payment. And after we work with, while working with the communities, finding out what they need in order to succeed in that world is really the goal here. There would be incentives that for specialists to get their their uh, patients back to their primary care provider um, more quickly than they do today. Sometimes we see um, some specialists hanging on to patients that really can be seen back in the um, primary care setting. And um, it's an easy visit. And so it's easy for a specialist to hang on to that person. Those are the type of changes that could help immensely because if they're not hanging on to those easy patients, it frees up um, some of the problems that we have with um, access and wait times. So th those are some of the benefits that, that could occur. I think you're gonna see a whole wide range of reactions by providers. My guess is that some are gonna be very supportive and some are gonna be very vehemently opposed to a change. And um, I think there could be some age correlation. I know at my age, I hate change. Um, but when I talk to these young uh, medical students that uh, um, are doing some internships uh, uh, around the state, that uh, um, they're a lot more open than us old, old people are. <laughs> Okay, th thank you. Good answer. Uh, it, it sounds like a lot of work to do in that area. So, Captain Black, did you want to? I, I'm just wondering do we have any data or research indicating that specialists are clinging to patients because they're easy to have visit? anecdotal evidence from primary care doctors. We have a primary care advisory group and we continue okay. to hear stories from them. Okay, thank you. So can I, I, I want to just jump in here and, and just because, you know, it's interesting from my, my observation is there's actually close alignment on certain parts of, mm -hmm. of what each of what you're saying. If I was listening to your, your presentation, Devin, I was thinking when you're showing the, the, the margins, the, the smaller and smaller margins, I swear there was a, some, a somewhat similar analysis by the Green Mountain Care Board. This is, a, this, this, is part of the, this is part of the case to be made for making the change. Because margins are small, because margins are not because hospitals are not sustainable with the margins that they have. Now, the irony, of course, is that we've asked the Green Mountain Care Board to keep the margins small because, in fact, we want to keep healthcare costs down. So you're damned if you do, and then damned if you don't right. for the Green Mountain Care Board. Frankly, at some level, I mean, there's a part to that. But but nevertheless, where you're saying the margins are getting so thin, and and we know there has to be a there has to be some margin to sustain a nonprofit entity in order to be able to reinvest in itself. And there's, there's still confusion on the part of some people about that, that there should be no margin, but that's simply not the case. But there's alignment around that. There's alignment about around that something needs to be done. We can't continue on the path we're on if something further needs to be done significantly. There's alignment around whatever it is we do needs to intensively involve community involvement and the hospitals have to be as central to that as well, and as well as the communities. The question, but, but that leaves the question in part that the, I hear the Green Mountain Care Board is saying, our experience with trying to regulate on behalf of Vermonters, the hospital system is, this is not working sufficiently 
And it's not because of margins and not like we're trying to lower the margins and you know, we get into these other issues, but it's like, we need to, we need to think about something much more substantial like global budgeting. And that's a proposal, but that's not a proposal the hospitals have put forward. The hospitals are saying, we, we're gonna, we, we, we want to continue along the path that we are and raise some Medicaid rates, you know, we're, we'll, we'll continue to try to be as efficient as possible. And the case that the Green Mountain Care Board has made is the three levers that I remember that they had three ways to get from here to there were raise rates, be more efficient, cut costs, be more efficient. And remind me of the third, because it's not immediately coming to mind, but it was. More volume. More volume. Yeah. More, vo yeah. more volume. Yeah. <laughs> more volume. Yeah, because it's based on a fee for service system. All right. And so, and so we know how that, 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 but if, if, so they're making the case that you can't get to where you want to go, where either of us want to go through the paths that we've chosen up to this point in time, accelerating those paths, they're making the case, don't get us there. And there's a part of me that says, let's look at that. Let's, 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 let's enter into that and get engaged in that process you know, laws and others. Mm -hmm. And if, if this isn't the right path, then demonstrate, and not, not in a hostile way, but help us understand how, in fact, we could get to the same place that we want to be, which is hospitals are valuable, incredibly valuable. Hospitals are essential, not incredibly valuable. They're essential to our communities. Hospitals are of high value to us, the services they provide. And I think we need to be careful about not using language that actually will encourage people not to engage with us, by saying there's uh, care that's, I forget what the phrase is, but there's a kind of uh, unnecessary. unnecessary care, uh, hanging on to easy patients. Those are, those are the kinds of things that actually, I think, scare people away or push people away because we're, we're, you're needing and wanting to actually have people engage rather than feel criticized or, uh, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. So. I think there's, and so my question is, and my question to the Green Mountain Care Board, is it premature for you to be asking for us to give you three to $5 million at this point in time? Now, the reason is because there's supposedly federal money sitting around, uh, one-time money, and I think that's part of what's driving it, but there's also the sense of urgency. I think there is a sense of urgency that we don't really have time to do nothing or continue on the same path for too many more years coming out of the really stressful time we're in. So I don't think it's just the money, um, but it, it feels a little bit like we haven't, you all haven't been able to engage sufficiently for us to make a conclusion, to draw a conclusion that the three to $5 million investment now is what we need to recommend. Unless you've already gotten to the conclusion that a global budgeting process for hospitals is a good out is is in fact a an important and possible positive path to move forward on. Yeah. And I think I'm going to speak for myself and maybe our committee. We have not done that work in great depth. I think our colleagues in the Senate have looked at that more closely for some period of time. I think some of us, and I'll include myself, are maybe uh, maybe more open to that concept because 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 the, the the path down fee for service does not look promising. It does not look promising. So I understand that analysis, but, but there's some piece of further engagement that I think is necessary because we're not, I think, I think so that's why I've, I think this conversation is useful that uh, yeah. we need to find our way through to some, you know, what, what is the next step that really helps move this decision-making conversation forward? And it's, I don't think it's just about the money. Anyway, I'm, that's... Yeah. Kind of my, so I'm going to well, shut. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Donahue and then Representative Houghton, and then, and then I think we're going to need to stop for today. And I think, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that we recognized and agreed yeah. years ago that fee for service was not going to get us there. The issue more is so we struck out on a path that we thought was going to resolve that, and it's not working the way we thought it would work. We're not, you know, it was always a coalition of the willing, meaning we get enough people, we can't get enough 
We can't get enough participants. Uh, we have not been able to meet those goals. And we have a far lower percentage of actual transition to uh, actual value-based payments than we had envisioned. So, so we've got to therefore recalibrate and refocus on how we get to that place that we all want to get. Um, I mean, I've made, um, have not hidden for several years my frustration about the fact that we were not really moving forward or very, very slowly. And people would say, well, change takes time. But, but, but we, you know, we, we have not been making progress any, to any significant degree. And we were stuck in a place that said, but we've got nothing else to try. We're stuck with keeping trying this because there's nothing else in fee-for-service clearly isn't. Well, what I'm hearing now is this is another route to try for getting there. And, and this, based on what we've learned so far, you know, is the right way to work on it. And in particular, that community engagement, which I think, you know, that didn't happen in developing the all-payer model and the way we started that. And I think that's a significant piece of why it didn't move the way we expected to. So, so that's kind of the fundamental difference. And I think, you know, when we look at this chart in terms of when things need to begin, um, you know, there, there is the need now, how long that money has to spread then. And, you know, maybe it's, it wouldn't all be needed this year because it's going to carry over, but then we tie into the, if it's available, uh, the one-time funds, but, but, you know, the timing chart, does suggest that that it is needed now. Yeah, yeah and maybe it is. Yeah. So I would just expand a bit on what uh, Representative Donahue said, and that to me, this this request for three to five million or five million, I think it is, yeah. is not to move us to global budgeting. It is to do the community process with the hospitals at the table, which they haven't really been able to be at because they've been so busy. That is the key. Three to five million dollars, change takes money, change takes time. And I think everyone's focused on global budgeting, where really we just need to say this is the next stage in this health reform in our state. And we need the community at the table, and that takes money. But that's that's actually not quite what they're saying here. Right, but that's how I'm yeah. seeing it. That's three and, million. Right. So whatever the case yeah. may be, five million dollars. We get the community at the table. We work to see if global budgeting is the right way. And honestly, at the end of the day, global budgeting might not be the right way. But the right. only way we get to do it is if we are all at the table. Yeah. Yeah. And I know Representative Lippert asked the question later about the total dollars spent in our state on health care. $5 million is a drop in the bucket. And yeah. Yes, we need to put more money in long term and subacute care and everything else, but we also need to put money into this, this action that we're trying to take. Sorry it's a, yeah. it's <laughs> almost twenty yeah. percent of the economy, six point five hey. billion dollars every single year spent by Vermonters, and at the end of the day, maybe there'll be something that will bubble up out of one of these community conversations that's an even better idea, but you know. That, that's the thing. If you don't try, you're not you're stuck with the status quo and the status quo isn't going to get you to where you want to be. Well, I'm remembering. Well, I was just going to say we're not advocating for the status quo. What we're trying to say is our system is fragile right now. We are advocating for greater Medicaid rates as well, but we see that things that we want to move towards value-based care. We see that that's the direction that the feds are going into, and we want to do this in the Vermont way. So I do see it, as Representative Potent was saying, as the community process piece. Right, now I'm, I'm remembering we, our committee sat in on some presentations that the Green Mountain Care Board had, um, was it more than a month ago now. And one, I, I remember in particular, one of the presenters was saying, basically saying there needs to be a deep community process mm -hmm. Uh, to get to engage, not just to engage the medical community, but the broader community in order to go figure out how to have a sustainable healthcare system. And I think that's, that's an essential part of what is being put forward here. And, and I think 
I mean, I, I, don't know, I guess I'll stop there. I just, I feel like some ways the, the having, having people buy into global budgeting before there's a community process, I think is part of the rub. Exactly. Rather than having the community engage in the hospital system, engage in a deep community process with global budgeting as a possible way forward and having people both be able to have, explore that along the way and if not, identify the other way that is going to work uh, is, is a piece of maybe reframing some of this in terms of process, because otherwise you're having, you're asking people to make, to buy into something that they may not have any enough information or the faith to like, well, look, we've, we've tried other things. We're not going to jump on this one next. Uh, and, and yet I think there's, we, there is evidence that this has worked in some places, in some manner. But as everyone said, it needs to be, if it's going to be the way forward, it needs to be a Vermont-based version, which I, everyone is also agreeing on. Chair so, I have a question for you. Okay. And, and, and <coughs> I just want to make sure my terms are right. When you say a community conversation at Rep. Holton do you mean the medical community? Or do you mean the community at large? When, when, when I hear community, I'm wondering what we're talking about. So we, well, we talked about that a bit the last time Green Mountain Care Board was in, and I think we asked that question of them. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but it is a broad community conversation. I mean, yes, it has to be driven by the medical piece, but it's not just for medical professionals. You're talking yes. patients and the average yes. average community member. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Am, I, am I everyone? Be that I think it should be restricted to the medical community to start, but that's just me. <laughs> well, I think that's how they framed it that they were going to start with the medical community and then spread. And then spread. Okay. okay. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Right. Okay. Okay. Can we I, are going to stop, but I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Susan. Yeah, just, just a number. I finally, I, I feel so bad. The head of our finance team has a sick baby and he still managed to answer me. Um, 3.3 billion was the hospital system. That's just the hospital. Yep. It's roughly 50% 50, 50 of our whole 6 billion plus. I don't family. know. Right. It is. Right. It's it's just under 50%. And But that number also includes those um, Vermonters who use hospitals elsewhere as well. So it's not just uh, Devin's yeah. uh, numbers. It's not just the it's that was the revenue the, for the hospitals, Kevin. He said the um, with the um, FPP NPR. Now I'm getting into you know. Why don't you get it's back the to revenue? Us. I'll send you a note. Right. How's that? You can put some footnotes on it and get back Perfect. to us. Perfect. It's a lot of money. <laughs> it's a lot of money. It's a huge amount of money. It's, it's a huge good. and it's a huge part of Vermont's economy. I think Representative Houghton's point is really important. It's five million compared to five seven Six billion. Billion, right? Right. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, thank I you. appreciate your Devin. Thank you for weighing in on behalf of the hospitals and others from the Green Mountain Care Board. Thank you, committee members. I think uh, I, I don't know. Personally, I think this was a helpful conversation to have. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you.